Costas back with the juice as always and Buddy Ryan who's our guest this weekend in the studio in New York in the game you folks are watching Cleveland of course in front of the Raiders 14 to 3 at the half elsewhere the Lions who have never won at Washington 0 and 16 against the Redskins there through the years trailing 10 3 at the half at RFK Dallas with Troy Aikman twice hitting Michael Irvin for touchdowns 41 and 87 yards leading the Cardinals 21 10 at the half Pittsburgh in front of San Diego halftime there 7 to 6 Miami with Marino throwing for two touchdowns in the first half leading 17-0 over the Rams. These are finals from earlier. Philadelphia is a winner 30 to nothing at home against the Broncos. Eagles are 3-0. Three more touchdown passes for Randall Cunningham. He's thrown eight this year without an interception. They held Elway and the Broncos to 82 total yards and just four first downs. San Francisco drops the Jets to 0-3. The Niners are 2-1. 31-14 is the final score in this game, but they lost John Taylor, the great wide receiver, for from somewhere to six to eight weeks with a broken left fibula. Their other great target, Jerry Rice, hauls in this five-yarder from Steve Young. 94th career touchdown reception for Rice. The record is Steve Largent's 100, and Rice will have it soon enough. Here's Young scrambling for a touchdown. This is still in the first half. Up the middle he goes, 10 yards for the score that makes it 14-0. Ken O'Brien, meanwhile, was having no such success. In at quarterback again with Browning Nagel hurt. Sacked three times in the first half. Credit for this one will go to Tim Harris. O'Brien threw two touchdown passes in the fourth quarter, but by that time they were losing 31-0. And the final is 31-14, and Bruce Coslett's guarantee earlier in the week of a Jets victory doesn't materialize. I told him I didn't say that to motivate him. I didn't. I didn't say it for uh, cannon fodder for uh, Coach Seifert's bulletin board either. And uh, some of the local editors chose to guarantee a victory. I never said that. I said we are going to win. What was I supposed to say? We're going to lose. Next question. Next question. Next score. Overtime. Houston 23-20 against the Chiefs at the Astrodome. Let's uh, show you how it ended. The Chiefs won the overtime toss. But they'll turn the ball over on this play. Dave Craig will hit J.J. Burden. Chris Dishman, however, will poke the ball loose. Doug Smith recovers it for Houston on the Kansas City 24. They run one play to set themselves up, and then they bring in Al Del Greco. He hits a 39-yard field goal earlier in the game. He had hit a 54-yard field goal, and Houston wins in overtime 23-20, to and both these clubs are now 2-1. and one. Green Bay in the wildest game of the day wins for the first time for the new head coach Mike Holmgren. First defeat for the Bengals' new top man, David Shula. Both those clubs, well, actually, Green Bay now one and two, and Cincinnati two and one. That was Don Mikowski having injured his left ankle on the sideline, and his replacement pulled the game out. This is the rookie Carl Pickens from Tennessee reversing his field and going 95 yards for a Bengal touchdown on the punt return, which made the score 10-0 in the second quarter. They led 17-3 early in the fourth quarter when this punt was run back for a Green Bay touchdown by the Packers' number one pick out of Florida State, Terrell Buckley. 58-yard TD brought them back to within 17-10. It was 20-10 late in the fourth quarter when Brett Favre, the replacement for Mikowski, second-year man out of southern Mississippi, flipped this touchdown pass to Sterling Sharp, who lunges across to make it 20-17. to A Bengal field goal made it 23-17. Now 19 seconds to play. Ball at the 35. No timeouts left. Favre pumps once, goes down the sideline to Kittrick Taylor, gets behind the cornerback for the touchdown. The extra point wins it, and the Packers take a 24-23 come-from-behind victory over the Bengals at Lambeau Field. Minnesota takes their record to 2-1. Tampa Bay has the same mark, 26-20. The Vikings win today at the Metrodome. New Orleans wins at the Georgia Dome over the Falcons 10-7 on Morton Anderson's 47-yard field goal with just under two minutes to play. And Seattle got 122 yards rushing from Chris Warren, and they sacked Hugh Millen six times. Tom Flory's first win as the Seahawks head coach, 10-6 today at Foxborough. Take a look at the list of quarterbacks who went down today. Mikowski, as we said, with the injured ankle, we're not sure how long he'll be out. They say ligament damage. Rich Gannon of the Vikings injured his hand, and Sean Salisbury quarterback them to victory. Okay. Vinny Testaverde bruised his forearm. He was replaced by Steve DeBerg, who actually did pretty well for a while, but the Bucks lost the game to the Vikings. And Stan Humphreys, in a game going on now in San Diego, goes out with an ankle injury, so Bob Galliano is in, so they're down to their third string guy. They lost John Fries in preseason, and now Humphreys. Those quarterback injuries Well, what's going to have to happen in the league, the offensive coordinators are going to start keeping people in to protect their quarterback. They send everybody out in the pattern, they split everybody out, they side adjust blitzes, which is cute, but your quarterback gets hit and they end up getting hurt. I just hope the league owners don't try to make any new rules to protect the quarterback because 
any other player in the game, any other position that got most of those injuries would still have to play. It's a physical football game, and you're going to hurt your ankles, and you're going to hurt your fingers. All right, Mark Bavaro has had more than his share of injuries, but he's back in the game with the Browns, and Gail Gardner will talk to him when we continue following these messages from your local stations. Gail Gardner joins us again, as she will each halftime this season. Mark Bavaro is a guy who didn't do much talking when he played for the Giants. Suddenly, he's opened up in what is a surprising new phase of his career. And, of course, I think part of it is that he has done something that I think was totally unexpected, yeah. perhaps even by him. You know, when he was released by the Giants prior to training camp in 1991, it was done in such a seemingly ungrateful manner that it caused a hue and cry among New York fans and media. In the offseason, he had bone grafted from his hip to try and replace the dead bone in his severely injured left knee. The Giants felt they would never see his face on an NFL field again. How wrong they were. He just was a relentless, aggressive, talented player. He just was physically a very imposing guy. He was all the things that a coach could want. Mike Ditka, Ozzie Newsome, perhaps the Hall of Fame. That was the company he was in. Until his left knee was destroyed against San Diego in October of 1989. After ligament surgery, he returned in 90, helping the Giants to their second Super Bowl title in five years, pushing himself despite a daily level of pain that most of us could not tolerate. I enjoy that season more than I did the 86 season. There's something about doing it again. You know, we were the underdogs. You know, when you pull something off like that, it's, it's, a, it's a better feeling, knowing that you've overcome the odds. But after Mark's experimental bone graft surgery in February of 91, the Giants felt those were odds he would never overcome, and they unceremoniously released him. So I had expected that the Giants would allow me to recuperate and rehabilitate through this upcoming season in the hopes of my coming back for the 1992 season. The Giants did not share that same thought. Who were you in 1991? What were you doing? My wife had to finish law school. Uh, I just assumed my role as a, as a husband, as a father, uh, as a house husband, uh, as a son, as a friend. A good friend, former Giants assistant, now Browns head coach Bill Belichick, brought Bavaro to camp, and surprisingly, he earned a spot on the roster. What has it been like for you coming into a whole new city and a whole new set of teammates? It's like being a rookie all over again. I played in the NFL, but I didn't play with these guys. You know, they don't know what I can do. Uh, they're not sure that I can still even do it anymore. It's a humbling experience, and I think more people need to go through that. At what point did you realize this was workable? I still don't know if it is. I, I, could, be, I could be gone next week. That's how fragile my knee is, you know, so... Uh, I try to do my best, and, and when that day comes that my best isn't good enough, then, then it'll be time to leave. Great story, but a concern here. Sure. There are abundant examples of this. Joe Namath, Jim Otto, you can go down the list. And there's more and more attention these days on the toll playing in the NFL takes, the inhuman toll mm -hmm. that it takes on a person's body, legitimate medical sure. concerns. And what is he thinking about? For the rest of their lives, of course. Right. What, what he said to me was, my knee is as bad as it will ever be. The doctors have told me it can't be any worse than it is. And so he feels he can continue to play, and they said he can continue to play. What you should understand is that they have filled a hole in his knee with a piece of bone. They don't even know if it's alive. The knee could collapse tomorrow like that. But he's not going to be any worse off than he is now. The knee has pain. He has arthritis. He knows it, but it won't be any worse. All right, we've got to get out of here. Thanks for the report, Gail. Our NFL Live halftime activities will continue.